We're very happy to have Sam Raskin for our speaker today. Sam received his PhD um, studying with Dennis Gates Corey at Harvard. He received it in 2014. After that, he was an NSF postdoc. He spent three years at MIT and one year at the University of Chicago. And since 2018, he's been an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Today, he will tell us about Tate's thesis in the Durham setting. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be, on the one hand, it's great to be able to give a talk in Australia without leaving my home. And on the other hand, uh, you know, I'm sorry I don't get to be there, you know. That's a, I had a great time the last time I visited. So everything I want to say today is joint um, work with uh, Justin Hilburn. Um, okay, so I want to uh, to talk about a, a recent result of mine with with Justin. Um, the and maybe I'll just say a couple words for um, context about um, about this. So uh, yeah, maybe I'll just say it without the screen sharing on. So <clears throat> uh, so this result it. What I want to do is I want to state the theorem kind of as uh, as simply as as possible, um, and just you know it'll be one of those like statement of theorem kinds of things. I'm hoping at the uh, end of the talk you have enough time to sort of give a feeling for for the construction. So there are some parts of it that uh, really can can be explained pretty explicitly, and well all of it can be explained pretty explicitly. But I think in an hour and a half I'll, I'll have time to say something, and <clears throat> um, something concrete about it. But part of uh, the motivation for it is that um, it it connects to a bunch of a couple of different subjects. So one of them is what uh, people call 3D mirror symmetry, which I'll try to say uh, what that is in a little bit. David Benzvi talked about it here, I guess, a few weeks ago um, in some form. And relationships with geometric Langland. So again, there's a um, a big recent body of conjectures, maybe from the last five years, that are just uh, they're of different nature than uh, than things that had really come before in the subject, and uh, and that was part of what I mean. That was part of what David was talking about. Um, I won't get too far into it, but a uh, part of it's a big part of the motivation for this project was to really you know test if those conjectures were reasonable and uh, and establish one case of it. So that's what what Justin and I um, managed to do with this project was. Um, proof a first kind of version of this uh, sort of you could say homological 3D mirror symmetry um, that uh, and compatibly with with some uh, symmetries in an abelian case. So um, I'm going to give uh, sort of one version of motivation. So uh, so in the following setting, uh, so I'm going to kind of be a little bit heuristic here, but let me say something about what Tate actually did. So uh, if K is a, um, well, I can just put local field, uh, then, and I'll, I'll say more about what I mean by that in a second, but for the moment, just you know, think field and maybe think a little bit harmonic analysis -y. Uh Then he studied the uh, decomposition of um, functions on K, those so suitable functions, I don't want to be too, uh, too explicit here, but the, the decomposition of this um, into uh, eigenspaces for um, characters of K cross the unit group. So in other words, just you know, to kind of rewrite this in a different way, you have K cross acting on K, so the group of units acts on uh, the sort of one-dimensional vector space um, itself, and so sort of GM acts on A1, if you want, um, and the idea is just you study the decomposition of this space into, uh, you know, like as a representation for this group K cross. So it's a sort of very natural representation, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and you basically want spectral decomposition. Um, so Tate 
did more than this. So, I mean, he, well, he used this work, for instance, um, he used an adelic version of, of this also in order to study, for instance, functional equations for zeta functions and so on. But, uh, you know, I kind of uh, first pass, this is what he did. And by the way, what do you, what, what did he find as his result? So uh, there's one kind of thing to know about, uh, about this thing, just if you haven't looked at it before. So in his result, basically what happens is that if you have a suitably non-trivial character of this K cross, uh, then there will be a one-dimensional eigenspace in the space of functions. That one-dimensional eigenspace will basically have a generator that's like the character itself extended by zero to all of k. So it takes the value zero at the origin, and otherwise it it takes the value of the character everywhere else. And uh, and so that works for for non-trivial characters and for trivial characters. There's something that kind of blows up. It ends up being related to poles of zeta functions and and that kind of uh, business. So that uh, that's going to be the rough outline, and uh, and now the goal here. Um, shadows are uh, didn't think about that. Okay, the goal here overall is uh, is to imitate this um, in what's called the Durham setting, um, or uh, yeah. So I'll say something about that in a second. Um, so what we'll do is we'll find a geometric version of this um, this kind of phenomenon, and uh, <clears throat> and it's somewhat uh, you know more refined than the story I just um, told about eigenspaces. So somehow the in a sense the functional analysis in uh, in the geometric setting behaves um, maybe more predictably. Um, okay, so for me, I'm going to fix little k now, um, a, a field of characteristic zero. For all intents and purposes, feel free to take k equals c. So at some point in my life, I started writing little k instead of c, but, you know, it's just a choice of conventions. Uh, and, but it, I'm not sensitive to um, finer algebraic structure at all. Um, and I'm going to take big K to be the field of Laurent series over C, over K. So when K is a finite field, if I take big K, then I get uh, one favorite kind of, of a local field like I was talking about before. Um, here, I'm, I'm taking this huge infinite dimensional vector space and uh, with, you know, some kind of topology on it even, like I want to think about the sequence T to the N is tending to zero. So this is a kind of topological um, K vector space. Um, and inside of here, let me just fix once and for all um, that I'm going to let O be the subring of Taylor series. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> um, and now there's a kind of general principle <clears throat> um, that that uh, in many cases, you sort of replace, um, <clears throat> so if you're in um, harmonic analysis, um, and you're working with functions on a space, um, <clears throat> for instance, on the points of an algebraic variety, then in geometric representation theory, Uh, you replace functions on a space by the category of D modules on, on the space X. So um, I usually call it D of X, but you might call it D modules on X. Um, so uh, I'll just say uh, briefly what D modules mean for my case of interest. So the idea is, I mean, very, uh, just if you haven't seen this stuff before, <coughs> Uh, kind of concretely what a, well, a D module is a sort of abstract version of a system of differential equations. So if you think about a, a system of uh, linear differential equations, say with algebraic coefficients, uh, so something like the differential equation defining e to the x, that's something that doesn't make sense on a manifold a priori. <clears throat> 
Um, for instance, you should take derivatives with respect to certain vector fields and they don't glue very well, like those systems don't glue very well because you could have changes of coordinates that, uh, that don't overlap very well. And what a D module is, is it's basically an abstract version of a system of differential equations that makes sense, for instance, on algebraic manifolds, um, smooth algebraic varieties or um, other variants. So it's, um, it's something that is manifestly coordinate free. Um, and so let me say what I mean in, in uh, my situation. So V is a finite dimensional vector space. Then um, a D module on V is um, a vector space, well, another vector space. Um, w, I should have maps uh, sort of so I think about V as a vector space and you know, sorry. And I'm gonna have uh, certain ways of having uh, functions on my vector space act. So here I might take a functional lambda to uh, sort of phi sub lambda. I also should know how vector fields act. So I want vector fields to act on, um, on my vector space. And maybe here I'll write, uh, v goes to c sub v. And then there's supposed to be a basic relation here, which is that if I take uh, the vector, the endomorphism attached to a, a vector, um, and I take the bracket of that with the endomorphism attached to a function, the linear function, this bracket is supposed to equal lambda v, so that's a number, times the identity for w. <clears throat> Um, so this is a generators and relations approach. Um, and so I'm going to let um, D of V uh, heart be the abelian category of, of D modules on V. And I'm going to let D of V equal the um, derived which in my mind means DG, but maybe it's not so important here, um, category of D modules. So in general, the definition is quite similar to this. So you should ha know how functions, so if you have uh, a, um, oh, sorry, these are some relations and I should say also that the CVs commute um, and the phi lambdas commute. So these guys commute with each other. Uh, these guys commute with each other. And if you bracket one against the other, you get the appropriate scalar multiple of the identity. <clears throat> um, so for a general algebraic variety, uh, instead of just a vector space, what I would do is I would, um, uh, I would say that I should know how functions on my variety act. So here I just took linear functions because those generate. Uh, I should know how vector fields on my let's say it was an affine variety, I should know how vector fields on my variety act. And again, there should basically the vector fields and the, well, the, the natural identity should be satisfied. Um, generalizing this. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is great, but what we have actually is an infinite dimensional vector space that we want to understand. So we wanted really to what I said, but maybe I should have spelled this out more, but what I, what I really want is to understand D modules on this vector space of Laurent series. So, uh, <clears throat> so what if V is an infinite dimensional vector space over a field? Um, then what should I mean? So then I can't really think about my vector space as an algebraic variety anymore. Instead, it's a union of varieties. It's what people call an in scheme. So uh, that's something that's a sort of formal union of its finite dimensional subspaces. So in this case, I'm still gonna have this kind of morphism. Um, vectors go to, go to these kinds of endomorphisms. But in this case, what I want is that this assignment should be continuous um, in a suitable way. So I can think about the dual to an infinite dimensional vector space as having a topology. It's sort of 
a pro it's like a pro finite style topology and i want this morphism to be continuous um and let me um say what i mean by that um so i want this to be continuous which means that for every vector maybe i call it w in in w i require that uh this p sub um, i should do this and that from v star to w <coughs> is going to factor through um a, a, so there's an action like this like act on w um and what i'm going to require is that this factors through some finite dimensional um sub so finite dimensional okay i want this to be continuous <laughs> let me say it that way which is the same thing as saying that so if i equip this with a pro finite topology that means that it should factor through a finite dimensional quotient space Um, or another way to say it is it only depends on my functional up to its restriction to some finite dimensional subspace of V. <clears throat> so very explicit condition. Um, but again, this doesn't really cover uh, my Laurent series case because my Laurent series, they also have a topology. They have a T-adic topology. So, uh, so what I require in that case, so let's say it's infinite dimensional with a, you know, what, is usually called a linear topology. So that means something like, uh, well, I just have Laurent series in mind here. So then I'll require this map to be continuous, but now my V also has a topology and I require this map to be continuous as well. And, uh, you know, same relations otherwise. So continuous in the same sense. <clears throat> so uh, in the case of Laurent series, all of this is super explicit. So I basically have a basis given by the t to the n's, it's a sort of topological basis for my, my vector space. And so each one of those functions gives me, you know, kind of, in a sense, two classes of endomorphisms, uh, if I weren't super careful about it. And, uh, and there are some conditions about continuity that uh, basically every vector should have an open stabilizer for both of these kinds of actions, and some, uh, some things should commute or have certain bracket relations. Um, if I can erase that. <clears throat> okay, so now what's my goal? So I have this category of D modules on K and I have an action on it of the category of D modules on K cross. So uh, here K cross, um, <clears throat> so K cross is um, itself, it's a group, um, again, what's called in scheme. And it basically looks as follows. So it's this unit group inside of the, um, the multiplicative group. So I'm gonna think about it as a sort of discrete copy of Z times O cross, so this is, I can write T to the Z. So everything will be some power of, of my uniformizer T times, uh, times an element in, in the units for uh, Taylor series. Um, and this itself is kind of T to the Z times GM times uh, a space that looks rather like this which is some uh, infinite dimensional vector space. So pro is sort of topologized infinite dimensional vector space. So again, D modules on here are not some kind of crazy um, abstraction. It's basically built from, you know, Z graded vector space. So there's some Z grading around that encodes that aspect. There's this uh, GM factor where D modules on GM are just like I said before. And, uh, and then there's some infinite dimensional vector space, like I was saying. And the group structure gives me, um, 
So there's a commutative group structure on this space. And this implies that my category of D modules um, is naturally monoidal. So um, monoidal meaning that it's like a kind of algebra. So if I have two objects, I get another one. Um, <clears throat> so if, yeah. Um, so you should think uh, if it's more familiar of something like if you take functions or maybe better is uh, distributions on a group, then you can convolve those. And, uh, and this group structure I'm talking about is a version of that. And then <clears throat> the fact that K cross X on K is gonna tell me that this category X, this monoidal category acts on this other category. Um, and now I can sort of restate this um, Tate problem. So the problem is understand some, uh, so I'll restate, but it doesn't quite make sense yet. So don't, don't worry about that. So understand um, kind of quotes, um, D of K as a D of K cross um, module. Any questions right now? Um, <clears throat> okay. So, um, so in order to explain really what that question means, I have to um, <clears throat> kind of uh, recall a, a version of local class field theory that's due to Bellinson and Drinfeld. So I wanna do, um, so I wanna cover geometric um, class field theory. Um, so this is, um, due to Valence and, and Drinfeld, and I'll um, <clears throat> kind of outline briefly what what uh, what the thing says. So I'm going to start with a warm up. So a warm up, the warm up is the following: If I take the category of D modules on the multiplicative group, there's a claim, which is that this is the same as something that uh, might look more intimidating, which is quasi-coherent sheaves on A1 mod Z. So, uh, <clears throat> so I think about Z as translating my A1. So I think about the group Z translating my A1 uh, to the right. So it, it sends, the generator sends lambda to lambda plus one. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of say what this means uh, along the way of proving it, but just uh, to give a feeling for the proof. So the left-hand side is the following kind of data. So it's a vector space W. Um, <clears throat> it has a certain automorphism. So it has an automorphism like T, let's say, um, from W to itself. So that's like the action of the function T on GM. And because that function is invertible, that tells me that uh, that it's an that's an isomorphism. I also should know how the vector field T D T X. So I have an automorphism and an endomorphism, and then there's a basic relation between the two of them, which is that uh, T D T bracketed with T is equal to. Uh, to, to one. No, I'm saying something wrong. Just equal to T. But anyway, there's some you know basic relationship between the two things. Um, and um, and on the other hand, what's the right-hand side? So the right-hand side you can think of as Z equivariant sheaves on A1. 
So uh, if I give this a1 maybe a coordinate lambda, then I have a vector space w with the following kind of data. So I have an endomorphism lambda from w to w. Um, I have some other automorphism from w to w, which is like what my translation operator is. Um, that's giving me the, the equivariant structure. So this is like equivariance. Um, and this is um, a quasi-coherent sheaf on A1. And uh, there's again a basic relation here, which is that uh, if I kind of, well, that this T lambda, wait, how should I do this? T lambda should equal lambda plus one times T plus or minus. And that's another way of encoding the same thing. So I have an isomorphism, an endomorphism, and then some basic relation here. Um, and so there's something, um, and so that, that's basically the proof. There's something extra that you can do here, which is that, again, both of these are monoidal. So this left-hand side is monoidal under convolution. So like using the group structure. So I, I call that convolution. And this is monoidal under tensor product or symmetric monoidal if you want under just tensor product of sheaves. And you can see that this is an equivalence of monoidal categories without too much work. Um, and so this is a kind of typical example of, of something in the subject, which is that you might start with D modules on some space, and then you end up with uh, sheaves that sometimes look a little bit, uh, you know, non-standard, like maybe quasi go here in sheaves that seem a little bit non-standard. Like we don't usually consider the space A1 mod Z in a first course in algebraic geometry, for instance, because it's it's not it's not an algebraic variety. It's not a it's not it's not the sort of space a person usually um, usually falls in love with. But uh, yeah, so it's a little funny, but the theorem makes sense and uh, and it's a nice statement. Um, yeah. And sort of, uh, there's a kind of nice way to think about this as a sort of Malin transform. So for instance, just uh, a little bit heuristically, like if you think about uh, GM as C cross, then uh, a typical character is going to send like, or, or R cross, a typical character is going to send an element uh, T to T to the lambda for some lambda. And that that lambda, well, that, uh, what am I trying to say? Okay, let me not, not try to say it. Um, <clears throat> well, for these purposes, that, that lambda, it's, it's well-defined mod integer. So it's kind of the same, this is parameterizing what those characters are. So there's this T to the lambda that appears, but in the geometric context, they only matter mod, um, mod uh, the integers. Okay. Sam, and so I can also kind of naively think that A1 mod Z is C star by the exponential map. Right. And I could naively think that. And so that won't give me anything reasonable on the right hand side? Exactly. It won't give you the right answer on the right hand side. So an algebraic, like, the this, this space, like, over C, it looks kind of. If you took the formal completions around every point, it would look the same as C star, C star. But for these algebraic purposes, that exponential map doesn't make sense. Like if you were trying to take that data I just wrote down about the endomorphism and the automorph the translation operator and turn that into a vector space with an automorphism that was supposed to be the exponential of that lambda, you're totally out of luck. Um, there's not a morphism from A1 to GM in algebraic geometry. So there's not a morphism certainly from A1 mod C to GM. Um, and so there's this funny business that it's a kind of algebraic version of something that's more familiar topologically. Um, and it's a little bit of a bizarre algebraic version of it. Um, so 
Now in this geometric class field theory, what we have is the following. So this is the theorem of, of Balance and Indrenfeld. So I'll just write PD here. Um, it says that if I take um, the space of invertible Laurent series, hmm, actually I don't like when it does that. Um, let me try this marker. Um, if I take D modules on the space of invertible Laurent series, that's going to be equivalent, again, as monoidal categories to sheaves on what I'm going to call for the stock Loxus GM. So some uh, certainly explanation is in order. So Loxus GM um, parameterizes the following data. So I think about it as this as a sort of space of local systems on the puncture disk, um, of rank one local systems on the puncture disk. So this is going to be uh, a a one dimensional K Laurent series T vector space um, V, uh, and then a map nabla from V to uh, to itself, let's say with a DT at the end, with the basic relation that there should be a connection. So nabla of FS is equal to uh, F nabla S plus uh, SDF uh, for F Laurent series and S an element of V. Uh, So, so uh, I said this slightly informally. So if you know like functor of points approach to algebraic geometry, what I really have in mind is that you should take, uh, I should tell you it's A points for every ring A, every K algebra A, and you just replace all the Ks here with A's. That's all. Um, and so uh, this is some kind of algebraic geometric object and it's, it's a little, Bit complicated, so it's sort of, it's a sort of moduli space. You can think of all the possible differential equations you could write, uh, just using like basically order one linear differential equations you could write, um, and mod the natural equivalence uh, notion there. So, basically, like what kinds of differential equations could you write? Well, one you could write is the differential equation for t to the lambda for any number lambda. So that gives you a map from this a one mod z that I just wrote down to Loxus GM, so it sends a point lambda to the connection. I'll just write nabla equals D plus lambda over T DT. Actually, I like the minus sign when I did this earlier. Um, <clears throat> so if, if nabla annihilates some, some vector, that's the same as saying that it satisfies the differential equation to be T to the lambda. Um, <clears throat> so D here is exterior derivative and I'm taking implicitly my my V is just K Laurent series T. Um, and another kind of thing I could do is I could take an exponential equation. Like I could take E to the one over T and that'll satisfy some natural uh, rank one differential equation here. Um, and it'll give me something that doesn't seem, it's a little bit uh, funnier. So like this in a sense covers the part coming from topology. It's like the regular singular part so those cover usual local systems. If you think about a local, a rank one local system on, on a puncture disk, just sort of topologically, you might think it's a one dimensional vector space with an automorphism, the monodromy. And that's like an element that's an invertible number. Um, but this is some algebra geometric version using differential equations instead. And so I see A1 mod Z instead of that topological C star. And in addition, the space is bigger. There are things topology doesn't know about, like the e to the one over t is non-trivial algebraically, but it's trivial topologically because you can solve it. Solve that differential equation, you know, using a whole amorphic function, but not an, an algebraic function in any sense. Um, so this is what their theorem says. And yeah, any questions about that? Oh, and some, so some, I was saying this to say some like, Basically, their theorem is built out of equivalences of the kind I just said a moment ago. And in fact, it's sort of the most, the biggest part. So this K cross has a copy of GM inside of it. And um, 
and that corresponds to this a1 mod z that I just wrote down under this equivalent. So it's really just a souped up version um, and more variables of what we were talking about a minute ago. And why is this geometric local class field theory? Uh, why is it? So this is again sort of asmonoidal categories. And so where the tensor product over here corresponds to the, um, the monoidal structure, the convolution monoidal structure over here. And the idea is that um, characters over here are like, like characters in whatever sense, they're basically like functors to vector spaces, symmetric monoidal functors to vector spaces. And those come from restriction along points in Loxus GM. Minor, minor correction, but, but that's basically it. And so what that's telling you is that characters on this side, these character D modules are gonna be the same as, uh, as rank one local systems on the puncture disk, which is what usual local class field theory tells you. Characters of the group K cross are the same as one dimensional uh, representations of suitable theta line group. Does that address your question? Mm -hmm. So these local systems replace uh, Galois theoretic data. Okay, and so now I can really sort of state the problem, which is uh, to understand um, understand uh, the space D of K as a D of K cross module category in spectral terms under geometric class field theory. Um, and so in order to state the answer, oops, I need one more ingredient. So it's a space that I started calling Y at some point and now I can't stop. So Y is, you know, in short, it's what people would often call maps from the puncture disk Durham um, into A1 mod GM. And explicitly it's the data of, of um, a point in the space of local systems. So I'm gonna write that as L nabla. So I think about this as a line bundle on the puncture disk with a connection in Loxus GM. I should have a section of my line bundle L. So like a vector in that vector space I wrote down um, and basically such that nabla of S is equal to zero. So it's a rank one local system plus a flat section. <clears throat> There are not many flat sections to rank one local systems, but the trivial local system has at least a one dimensional space worth. Um, <clears throat> so there's a structural result um, of ours. And basically what these structural results say is that coherent sheaves on Y make sense. Um, so I don't want to get into this a ton, but basically if you try to think about what are coherent sheaves on a space, it's difficult in infinite dimensional situations. So like uh, we're used to working with Noetherian rings, a lot of times modules over Noetherian rings and submodules of finitely generated modules are finitely generated and so on. And that doesn't hold at all in this kind of context. And so you have to be more careful what you mean by coherent sheaves on those kind of spaces, but um, but the fact is that they that they do. And now um, my theorem with Justin states the following. So um, D of K is equivalent to what's called the space of incoherent sheaves on Y. So uh, I might kind of avoid saying a ton about what this means, but I'll address it in a second. Um, <coughs> compatibly with local class field theory. So over here, I have uh, the space D of K cross acting on D of K. Valenson and Drinfeld tell you that this is the same as quasi-co of Loxus GM. Um, and that acts here because um, this acts, again, using just tensor product monoidal structure, just because there's some forgetful map from Y to Loxus GM. Um, okay, what does intco mean here? You, it's, it's something slightly technical, but, but uh, one 
one way to say it is that this Y, it's a union of spaces. And so uh, when I work with, so it's, it's an end kind of thing, like it's hugely infinite dimensional in some sense. And when I work with, and, and so at the level of like rings, it corresponds to a topological algebra. Um, in this case, in a very precise sense, it corresponds to a topological algebra with a grading, and I'm considering graded modules over that ring. And, uh, <clears throat> and when I consider those kinds of modules, it's like before, I want to consider, I want the topology to interact well with the vector space structure. And one way to say that is with this word endco. Um, so it says that you should basically, all modules should sort of be a union of discrete modules in a suitable sense. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, that's, what, that's what that, that means. It's, uh, in usual algebraic geometry, you only see a distinction for singular varieties, and it's only uh, in stuff that's out, outside of usual derived category world. And so it's a kind of technical thing in finite dimensional algebraic geometry, but has a kind of good reason to, to appear here at least. Um, or it seems, it, it's not necessarily something you learn in a first course in algebraic geometry, let me say it that way, because uh, it involves heavy duty derived category stuff. Um, okay, any questions about that statement? So these are super explicit objects, these deserve uh, more discussion, and I'm hoping to be able to do that at the end of the talk. Naively, if I look at this map from Y to local systems, it seems like it's kind of nowhere near subjective, but is there some uh, kind of derived business going on? Very subjective. Uh, it has a section given by take the zero section of your local system. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So good point. <clears throat> so sort of in some, in some sense, the map, well, you should be careful how you say this, but it's kind of like an isomorphism away from the trivial local system, basically, because if you're non-trivial, if you're a local system and you have a non-zero section, that's an isomorphism with the trivial local system. Um, and so that matches this thing I said in the very beginning about Tate's original work. So it's kind of like you think about this space of local systems as the kind of uh, space of characters, like one dimensional characters for the loop group K cross. And mm -hmm. when you take the fiber over a non-trivial local system, you're supposed to see a sort of one-dimensional eigenspace um, corresponding to that non-trivial local system. And that's, that's what this geometry is matching. And then mm -hmm. there's some kind of blow up, some explosion that happens near the trivial local system. Mm -hmm. And in tight setting, what is, sufficiently non-trivial mean? Uh, so it's, uh, in his setting, it would usually mean that the restriction of the character to O cross is non-trivial. Mm -hmm. um, which sort of I, matches what we, what we see here. I mean, there you, there's some extra concern also. If you restrict to O cross and you're trivial, are you non-trivial on the uniformizer also? Um, that's kind of harder to make sense of in the geometric situation, but is, is a, an important thing. In, in mm -hmm. this and I guess these characters are the kind of correspond to the Frobenia, I know, is it? Is it? And... The, those, you mean the extra characters? Yeah. The one that the one that um, Tate would l not like to, I mean, the ones that, just the one that give these extension by zero characters on the other side. Um, wait, what do you mean they correspond to Frobenius? Um, I mean, I can just define a character that's just, um, just factors through, that's trivial on O star and just factors through a Z mod MZ. Yes. And these correspond to just the these correspond to Frobenius extensions, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and there's not really good versions of either ones of those in the D module situation. Mm -hmm. Like sort of if you want a character of Z, it's gonna be tensoring by some one dimensional vector space, but those are all trivial. Maybe a little non-canonically, but that's what happens here. 
Huh. Okay, so that was a statement of the results. So now I just sort of want to um, briefly say some stuff about um, context for this. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so this kind of theorem, so it, it, uh, it's maybe of interest to different people for different reasons. So let me say one kind of uh, perspective that's a little bit um, maybe opposite to the one I had going into the project or that I usually uh, take on. So, <clears throat> uh, so this is a sort of theorem about um, what could be called 3D uh, field theory is somehow like maybe algebraic or something. Um, so, okay, what do I have in mind when I say 3D field theory? So I'm thinking in algebraic geometry. And one of the, uh, the things that I learned when I learned about topological field theories is that to an n-manifold, they should attach a number. And well, I don't really know how to think about three manifolds using algebraic geometry, like curves or two manifolds. So no idea what that is supposed to mean. But what kind of things are these? So I don't know what a three manifold is, but then the next thing I remember is that, so if it's supposed to be a 3D theor theory, it should attach numbers to, to three manifolds, and then it should attach vector spaces to two manifolds. So this is the kind of thing that attaches to a, to a two manifold, so uh, so I'm just kind of trying to write down what sort of data a field theory is. So it's a rule that has the following kind of data. So if I have, a, it should be a closed two manifold. So I have some vector space um, attached to uh, maybe some ambient smooth projective curve. So this is one kind of data that I should have um, and uh, the other kind of data I should have is that, so, okay, then I, then the next thing I learned about topological field theories is that people say you should keep going down to lower manifold, lower dimensions. You should go as low in the dimensions as you're able to go. And so, uh, and each time you do, you should, you should go from number to vector space to category to two category and blah, blah, blah. And so the next thing I learned was that for a one manifold, the closed one manifold, you should have a category. And so I don't know what, what a, uh, well, I know a little bit better what a closed one manifold is than I know what a three manifold is. So namely, uh, what I can do is I can imagine I'm supposed to have some category. So I'm gonna write dgcat, because that's just what I'm used to. Uh, every time I have some point inside of my curve um, and, uh, <clears throat> and this is supposed to denote the punctured disk at that point, so kind of spec of the ring of Laurent series with uniformizer kind of based at that point. Um, and then there should be some axioms, and these axioms are a little weird uh, in this situation. Um, and maybe I won't, won't get into it so much. So it's this kind of data, there should be, you know, there should be a little bit more extra structure around and so on, but uh, at first pass, these are the kinds of um, major things. Maybe one one kind of uh, thing I'll say is that there are certain uh, no, I don't want to get into it a lot. <clears throat> um, so it's finding some axioms and there should be some extra structure, but again, kind of coarsely, this is what it should be. The axioms, I just want to say, they tell you how to recover Z of X from the Z of puncture disk thing and some extra things. It's, you know, that's how field theories are supposed to work is you should be able to build higher dimensional things out of lower dimensional things um, and some kind of gluing constructions. Um, okay, so, uh, and this category people will often call category of line operators in this, uh, in this particular context. And so uh, there's a couple ways to build these sorts of data. So, um, and what I want to focus on for the purposes of this talk is that category. Um, um, so how to build 
um, 3D field theories. So 3D theories. So uh, there's going to be what I call type one. So here you have some ambient Y around. So Y is going to be a smooth, let's say, affine variety. You're going to get something I'm going to very uh, evocatively call ZYA. <laughs> Um, so this is some kind of 3D theory. And let me just tell you what it does on the puncture disk. And maybe I'll omit the point from now on. Um, so what it does on the puncture disk is it produces, so it's supposed to produce a certain category and it's gonna uh, produce D modules on what I call Y of K. So this is D modules on the space of maps from, uh, from the puncture disk into Y. So earlier, uh, like when, if I had considered Y to be A1, that would have been the category we were considering, the category of D modules on that space. Um, and so, and, and actually I, I can maybe allow this to be a stack a little bit more generally. Um, so I'll just put smooth stack uh, and with some properties. So. Um, and so if I take Y to be as above, there's a second 3D theory I can attach. And what it does on the puncture disk, what its category of line operators is, is it's going to be this category of coherent sheaves on what people will write as the space of maps from the puncture disk to ROM into Y. And so that's, again, it's sort of like, if I think about Y, uh, These are going to be maps from the puncture disk into Y plus an infinitesimal, uh, like an, an identification of infinitesimally close points in a suitable sense. So it's kind of maps with a kind of connection on it. Um, and I'll just kind of remark that there's a more general context that covers uh, many of these two kinds of examples. Uh, and maybe, uh, well, I won't use this at all during the talk, but uh, if I have a chiral algebra, let's say on this X, um, this gives rise to uh, to some kind of 3D theory, Z sub A. And so here, what it does on the puncture disk is take the category of modules for that factorization algebra, oops. Um, and what it does on all of X is it forms uh, what's called the vector space of conformal blocks for the theory. Yeah, and so then, these two classes have natural examples, at least when Y is uh, an affine variety. So this would be something like a CDO, a chiral algebra that's like a CDO. And this would be uh, a chiral algebra of jets into the constant D scheme defined by Y. <clears throat> so in other words, these two examples fit into this uh, third one, at least in affine sorts of situations. Um, And so um, there's a large body of conjectures. So there exists a large body of conjectures um, that are all called 3D mirror symmetry, um, maybe 3D homological mirror symmetry. And they take the following shape. So you take some Y. Um, and you take some, so this is going to be some kind of smooth stack, like I was saying before. Um, you take some other Y dual, so these are smooth stacks. And they should be very particular smooth stacks. So basically, they should appear in a certain list. Um, and what you expect is that this theory for Y, its A twist, is supposed to be equivalent to the theory for Y star, but for the B twist. So uh, in, in this sort of perspective, there's, well, how much do I want to say about this? Uh, there's supposed to be more fundamental theories attached to, to Y and to Y dual uh, that are what are called supersymmetric field theories. And for supersymmetric field theories, you can form simpler field theories out of them by a property, by something called twisting. And for the, these kinds of theories, these you're supposed to say 3D N equals four theories, they have A twists and B twists. 
And so the A twist for one theory should be the B twist of the other theory. Um, and uh, yeah, and so basically this theorem with Justin um, sort of suitably enhanced to involve that curve um, is uh, 3D mirror symmetry for uh, Y being, okay, I should get this right, A1 and Y star being uh, A1 mod GM. So this is one of the pairs that appears on that list. And in fact, you also have ZYB is equal to ZY star A in this case, and that's a much simpler result in this situation. Um, and as far as I know, this is our work is the first um, kind of non non uh, non standard case in which this kind of conjecture is really proved um, in this form. So 3D mirror symmetry appeared in 1995, um, and it was only I think kind of recently that it was in the last few years that it's really been understood in these kinds of um, mathematical terms and algebra geometric terms and. Uh, it's a, you know, this is some, some kind of test. Uh, let me say that also that in a lot of situations, something like this happens. So uh, in these 3D mirror symmetry conjectures, it often happens that a group G acts on the space Y that appears here. Um, and, uh, and in that case, there's an action of the loop group. And you can try to understand more generally what, like, how uh, how geometric Langlands, which is about actions of these loop groups, is going to um, interact with those particular y's, and that's uh, that's expected to be a very robust subject um, more broadly. So there's a large so part of what David was talking about, um, I think a few weeks ago, was that and what he's been working on with uh, with Yanis and Akshay is is about uh, or the secular is is about this this uh, sort of circle of ideas, so non abelian versions of these conjectures and uh, and yeah, and those ideas I should say go back to many people so uh, Hilburn new and uh, and Braverman Finkelberg in the math literature and uh, and Gyota Witten, I think in the physics literature. Um, and so, yeah, I was happy about this. I got really excited about it because it, you know, seems like it actually works, <laughs> um, those conjectures. And, um, yeah, so maybe now I can try to, uh, otherwise I want to try to give um, a quick outline of the construction. So I'm going to take some notation here. So let me remind why was the set of local systems with a flat section. <clears throat> and I'm going to write y less than or equal to 1 to mean that this local system has regular singularities. So flat section s. Uh, this has regular singularities. And so by definition, this means the following. So I'm going to um, take y base changed along this locus gm to uh, basically bgm times a1 mod z. So there's some stacky factor here that has to do with a grading. This bgm, if it's not something uh, fun for you, just kind of ignore it. But it has to do with the fact that local systems all have stupid automorphisms, just kind of multiplying by a scalar multiple of the identity is an automorphism, um, non-zero scalar multiple. And then there's this a1 mod z. There was there were those uh, local systems I was writing down earlier. Um, and so I can be super explicit about what this is. So there's going to be some GM I should write in in a second, but this is going to be the following sort of data. So I have um, uh, I have 
my uh, <clears throat> my section uh, S, which is some uh, Laurent series. Oops. Um, so I can think about it as explicitly having coordinates like this. Um, so I is going to be sort of sufficiently large minus infinity. And these AIs are going to give me coordinates on this space. So these are sort of, they're, they're things that are allowed to change, whereas the T isn't. So I think about these as, as numbers or whatever. Um, my nabla is supposed to have the form d minus lambda over t dt for some lambda. So again, lambda is my other coordinate. And then the basic property here is that nabla s should equal zero, which in this context is the same as saying that uh, what i plus minus lambda um, times ai is equal to zero for all i. And then I'm supposed to mod out by this z times gm. Um, and here, what does my z do? So my z is supposed to multiply by t everywhere, uh, and it changes my lambda to lambda plus one or lambda minus one. So I just sort of re-index all the terms of my Laurent series and I change my lambda accordingly. So I shift every ai to ai plus one, and I change my lambda to lambda plus one so that the same equations still hold. And that gives me a z action. And what does my gm action do? My gm action scales the ais and doesn't do anything at all to lambda. Um, so that's what the space is if you unwind, if you open up the box a little bit. Um, and you restrict to this regular singular sort of um, paradigm. By the way, if people know algebraic geometry, then they might wonder at this point, like, is this derivedly correct? And the answer is yes, it's derivedly correct. One of our structural results is that um, if you try to define things in a, in a derived way or in a not derived way, you get the same answer. Um, although that won't really matter so much for this discussion. So these are my coordinates. I'm going to keep using them. I need two other quick spaces. So I'm going to write y tilde here to mean the kind of corresponding z torsor. So this is like if I wrote down the same kind of data, but I only mod it out by gm, but less than or equal to 1. And then there's one other thing that makes sense to take once I impose that condition, which is that there's some z less than or equal to 1. Um, and this is, again, it's going to be the same sort of data. But now I require my ai t to the i to be a Taylor series instead of a Laurent series. Um, and then there's this lambda around, and there's some such that conditions, and then I mod out by gm. I'm writing a bunch of dot, dot, dots, which even though it's always super clear to me, I know it's not always clear to other people. So here, this is. This is all the same, but again, I'm modding out by gm instead of by z times gm. So I no longer consider things to be the same if they just differ by that translation operation that I said of shifting all of the Laurent series entries. And here, I'm imposing something additional. I'm requiring that my Laurent series is an honest Taylor series. So it's closed under that gm action. It makes perfectly good sense, and it's some kind of closed sort of sub, sub uh, variety sort of thing. Um, OK, I'm going to start. Racing. Um, and okay, so now there's going to be a claim which I'll connect to our result in a little bit. But let me take a certain canonical object f, which will be a coherent sheaf by fiat on 
uh, the space y less than or equal to 1. And what is this? This is going to be the projection of the structure sheaf of z less than or equal to 1. So again, the basic picture I had over here was there's this embedding. So this is Taylor series inside of y tilde less than or equal to 1. And now this maps to y less than or equal to 1. This is the Taylor series condition. This is my z torsor. Um, and this map here should certainly be my pi. So the claim is that this object, which again, if you just run the definitions, I'm, which I'm hiding, it should be a coherent sheaf. Um, this has a canonical action of a vial algebra. Um, so, uh, okay, so let me explain. So uh, what I want to do is just quickly construct this vial algebra action. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice. It's, I think, comprehensible. And then I'll explain what this has to do with our, our, uh, results. So, um, so let me take t from y tilde less than or equal to 1 to y tilde less than or equal to 1 to be the action of 1 in. So this thing's supposed to be a z torsor. It has some canonical z action, aka some canonical automorphism, which is again that multiplication by t thing, by little t. And let me take big t to be that, that automorphism. So um, in general, maps from F to, sorry, yeah, from F to itself are going to be the same things as maps from OZ less than or equal to 1 to the direct sum over all integers of T to the N push forward or pull back or whatever of itself. Um, and now, so I'm going to define two maps like this, and I'm going to check, so it's, this will be some one-dimensional vial algebra. So vial algebra, I should say, it's, it's the algebra of differential operators on, on a one-dimensional vector space. So I'm saying it's sort of, it's like a sort of D module here for a one-dimensional uh, situation. And so here uh, are two maps. So the first one is the following. So, uh, okay, I'm not sure if I'll have enough room here, but yeah, this is the way the, yeah, the adjunction works in this case. Maybe I'll just write it like this to mean, okay. That's fine. So a thing to observe is that T, not its inverse, but T itself preserves this uh, the z less than or equal to one, right? Like, what t does is it takes my my Taylor series or Laurent series solution and multiplies it all by t, and changes the connection accordingly. And if I had a solution that was a Taylor series, then t times that solution is also a Taylor series. And so that tells me that this map takes z less than or equal to one into itself. That's not true for its inverse, but it's true for the automorphism itself. And so that gives one map, let me just call it tau, from OZ less than or equal to 1 to um, T star of OZ less than or equal to 1, just by restriction of functions. Um, <clears throat> and this is contained inside of that direct sum of T to the N star OZ less than or equal to 1. Okay. Um, so that's going to be one of my two endomorphisms. 
just works like that. Um, so my other endomorphism, so called D tau, is going to map OZ less than or equal to 1 to T inverse push forward OZ less than or equal to 1. And so this T inverse, again, it's like multiplication by T inverse at the level of those Laurent coefficients. Um, so it doesn't preserve Z less than or equal to 1 anymore. It certainly could send Taylor series to not Taylor series. Um, so I can't do the same trick with restriction, but I'll do something uh, kind of kind of different instead. So so uh, <clears throat> so here, like, what's the difference between these two spaces? So I have my my uh, coordinates, my sort of sum ai. Well, I have these ai's that are my coordinates, and on here, so like on on t inverse of z less than or equal to one what I require is that these be greater than or equal to minus one. And then I have a bunch of equations that were all like I minus lambda times AI is equal to zero. <clears throat> um, and so one thing I can do is, for instance, I can map T inverse star OZ less than or equal to one. Uh, there should be a better way to say this. So z less than or equal to 1 inside of uh, this t inverse z less than or equal to 1. This is defined by the equation. It's like cut out by the equation. It says a minus 1 is equal to 0. So that's the condition to be like in z less than or equal to 1. So the difference here, here is that you allow these, this a minus 1 also um, as a possible coordinate. Um, and I then, in particular, sort of have this equation, minus 1 minus lambda times a minus 1 is equal to 0. <clears throat> and so what that's going to tell me is that, like, if I take this t inverse of the structure sheaf of this, this object, so suppose I took the, the map, which was multiplication by uh, the same thing, so this minus 1 minus lambda, uh, just this one factor here. So I take that multiplication map from here to here. This map kills the function a minus one. And so it's going to factor through this sheaf mod a minus one, which is exactly, so it factors through here, but that's exactly this term, this oz less than or equal to one. Um, and so this is going to be my map d tau. So it's multiplication by minus 1 minus lambda. And now there was a claim, which is that the vial algebra relations are satisfied. And uh, this is uh, this is really uh, sort of I find satisfying to check every time. So I could do the following games. So one is I could restrict. Oops. So this is restrict down to here. But now if I want, okay, maybe I'll see in a second. Okay, let me go the other way first. So first I can multiply by that minus lambda minus one to get to t inverse star oz less than or equal to one. Okay, just the structure sheaf of that push forward thing. And then I could map here by restriction. So this is sort of d tau and this is tau. On the other hand, I could restrict, which is this map tau I defined before. But now if I want to go from here to here, I shouldn't multiply by minus lambda minus one, but I should multiply by minus lambda. because the translation implicitly changes lambda to lambda plus one or whatever it is, lambda minus one. Um, like that's the way 
this translation operator interacts with lambda. It changes lambda to lambda plus one. And so when I go from here to here, I pick up minus lambda instead. And so now I see that the, that the bracket d tau uh, tau minus tau d tau is equal to, well, there's some kind of sign convention every time, but uh, here I'm getting, it's equal to the identity because these, it's basically like this circuit is multiplication by lambda and this circuit is multiplication by lambda plus one up to sign. And the difference between the two of them is the identity, which is the standard vial algebra relation. And so, um, so what does that do for you? So one thing you can do with a action of, of a vial algebra or an algebra on some object is you can map modules over that that um, that algebra into the category that you were just talking about, as long as you work with big objects. So what this will give me is a functor to int co of y or y less than or equal to one. <clears throat> right, d of a one. Uh, to this int co of y, it gives some canonical functor, and under our equivalence, this corresponds to the following thing. So you can map, if I think about O as this string of power series, um, the way our construction works is that we have, so I have K double brackets T, here I can send T to zero to get a map down to like A1 or K or something, um, depending on your perspective on things. And then I can embed this into the ring of Laurent series, k. <clears throat> and if I do sort of pull push for d modules, that gives me a uh, actually fully faithful functor like this. And our construction is built out of using this functor and a bunch of higher rank versions of it for higher orders of singularities and uh, you know, to build a functor and then to show that it's an equivalence. And so that's the, the strategy that we use um, for this result. So I think that's, uh, that's what I've got. So when you were saying you, for higher orders of singular, singularities, you've got a y less than or equal to two and a y less, less than or equal to three. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And there, there it gets a little bit, yeah. It's a little bit less explicit in, in those cases, but well, it can be made very explicit. And so you really explicitly write down vial algebra actions on each of those, like yeah. higher dimensional vial algebra actions. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then we check some fully faithfulness, so some vanishing of X and, and so on, um, and potential surge activity. That's the way it works. And you can see those actions, are, they end up being kind of forced on you by their compatibility with class field theory. So the, the existence, there's something to prove, basically. Like here, I use this fact that two elements multiply to give you zero. So you need, you know, it's, so it sort of wasn't for free in some sense that you had this vial algebra action on this object. Um, and similarly, there's something to check, although it's kind of forced on you what, it, what the map should be, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for having me. Nice to thank you very much. You visit Australia. <laughs>